Counting to God, Part 11. We've been going through the book, Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief, written by Douglas L. in 2014. It is available on the internet. Uh, the cover for the book is like this. Uh, it is also available in a card copy if you want it, but the internet is free. Uh, we're in part two, The Science of Belief, and we're in chapter 13, which is called Our Special Earth, Was Earth Designed for Life? Douglas L. begins, a view of habitable zones for animals as well as microbes and in the galaxy and universe as well as around our sun leads to an inescapable conclusion. Earth is a rare place indeed. That's by Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee who wrote the book Rare Earth. As far as I know, they're not theists. Um, <clears throat> In March 2009, the United States launched the Kepler Space Observatory, named after Johannes Kepler, the 17th century German astronomer, noted briefly in Chapter 5. The Kepler Space Observatory measures tiny variations in the light from over 145,000 stars in our section of the Milky Way. Planets are detected by the periodic dimming of light as they pass in front of their host stars. Some of us may remember that we've seen some of that um, data. Before it malfunctioned in May 2013, Kepler had detected over 3,000 planet candidates. Our mass media translates these findings into a message that our Earth is not special. A January 2013 NASA news release claimed that one in six stars may have an Earth-sized planet, which led to headlines of 17 billion Earth-sized uh, planets in our galaxy. Possibly true, but definitely misleading. It takes a lot more than being Earth-sized for a planet to be capable of supporting life, and especially for a planet to be able to support life over billions of years. Beyond the headlines within the scientific community, there is a growing realization that Earth is special. This insight is relatively new, largely in the last 25 years. In this limited area, at least, the paradigm is beginning to shift. Modern science is revealing the wonder of planet Earth. How special is Earth? It may not be the most critical part of the great debate, but it, to me it's one of the most interesting. The wonder of our universe created just right for life and the overwhelming evidence of design in the most primitive form of life surely can stand on their own. They would not be tarnished if perfect Earth-like planets were as common as grains of sand. But the scientific evidence suggests our Earth may be pretty close to unique, at least in our galaxy. In The Privileged Planet, Guillermo Gonzalez and Jay Richards explain what is special about Earth and do the math. They estimate the odds of uh, finding another planet as welcoming as Earth in our entire galaxy may be less than one in a hundred. To me, the discovery that our Earth is special is the sixth wonder of modern science. Skipping a paragraph, as you know, I don't usually read this straight through. Um, the numbers and calculations in this chapter are not as overwhelming as in the fine-tuning in biology chapters. However, here there is no one in a zillion, zillion stunning scientific fact. Here it is more the gradual accumulation of modest improbabilities. The calculations themselves are less precise, in part because of the science of how and why planets form and of what is special about the Earth is still young. In a way, the debate begins with uh, Nicolaus Copernicus. As we saw in Chapter 5, Copernicus suggested that Earth and other planets in our solar system revolve around the Sun. Some attempt to generalize Copernicus's revolutionary insight into a so-called Copernican principle. And he's quoting, It is evident that in the post-Copernican era of human thinking, no well-informed and rational person can imagine that the Earth occupies a unique position in the universe. Um, others go further and falsely impugn to Copernicus a pronouncement of universal mediocrity, that there is nothing special in our Earth, in us, or life, or even in existence. Which, of course, Copernicus himself did not believe. What is special about the Earth is its ability to sustain life. 
Life as we know it can exist only when the right raw materials are present, only when protected from radiation and bombardment, and only in a Goldilocks zone that is not too hot and not too cold. Life thrives only when conditions are stable for a long period. In each of these ways, modern science tells us that Earth is special. The right galaxy. In the beginning, seconds after the Big Bang, the universe was mostly hydrogen. 75% by mass, with some helium, about 25%, and tiny traces of lithium and beryllium. I was not aware of the beryllium, because it, I think that beryllium-8 spontaneously breaks apart. Uh, the heavier elements, oxygen, carbon, iron, and so on, were created later, either forged in stars as they burned, or squeezed together by catastrophic stellar explosions. Each atom in our bodies of these heavier elements was forged in the interior of a star. We are built from the dust of dead stars. That means the carbon is new. Heavier elements have chemical properties that make life possible. Oxygen can give or take two electrons rather easily. It interacts, sometimes very quickly, with many other elements and molecules. Flames burn in oxygen and metals corrode as they oxidize. Carbon is a stable platform co for connecting atoms. It has been suggested that 26 elements, including oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, iron, and copper, are important, perhaps necessary ingredients of life on Earth. Um, by the way, you'll notice that copper is heavier than iron and therefore cannot be made in a standard star. It takes a stellar explosion to make copper and everything heavier than that. Compared to the universe as a whole, our Earth has a high proportion of these heavier elements. Cosmologists, person who study the, the history and structure of the universe, call all of these heavier elements, elements other than hydrogen and helium, metals. Chemists don't think of oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur as metals, but to a cosmologist they are, and we will use that definition in this chapter. They were created inside stars. Many of the first stars in the early universe were massive. When a massive star dies, a star with an initial mass more than eight times the mass of the sun, it explodes. The explosion is called a supernova. As the massive stars of the early universe burned and then exploded, they seeded the universe with metals but the process has not been uniform. Many galaxies did not and do not contain interstellar gas dense enough to form a lot of massive stars. These galaxies are metal poor and they probably don't have habitable planets among their billions of stars. Many globular clusters are metal poor and unlikely candidates for life as are also most small irregular and elliptical galaxies. One estimate is that 98% of the galaxies in our part of the universe may have a smaller percentage of metals than the Milky Way. We're in the top 2% there. The right distance from the galactic center. The metallic content of stars generally varies with their distance from the center of a galaxy. The greater mass density of the center gives birth to more massive stars, and as they die they ex and explode over millions and billions of years, their metals are distributed to younger generations of stars. The outer sections of the Milky Way have a lower density of matter and they have had fewer massive stars. The stars and planets there are metal poor. Scientists now believe planetary systems like ours are unlikely to be found in the outlying rural areas of our galaxy. So not only do you have to be in a big galaxy, but you have to be close enough to the center. The center of our galaxy has the necessary metals for life, but it is a dangerous neighborhood. A black hole equivalent in mass to three to four million suns, an entity so heavy and dense that not even light can escape, is believed to rule the center. The accretion disk surrounding it generates lethal radiation that would sterilize any life. Stellar explosions are also deadly. It is now believed that a supernova within 30 light years or a more powerful gamma ray burst within 3,000 to 6,000 light years would severely affect the life on Earth. Now, the gamma ray burst is not necessarily uh, deadly unless it happens to be aimed at you. 
but in supernova, certainly would not have to be aimed at any anybody in order to completely wipe out life on Earth. Gamma ray bursts can produce more energy in a few seconds than our sun will produce in its entire lifetime. No known extinction event in the fossil record can be tied to a supernova or gamma ray burst, but traces of excess iron 60 in the ocean floor from 2.8 million years ago may have come from a supernova in a group of massive stars called the Scorpius Centaurus OB Association when it was about 100 light years from Earth. Now, let's go back just a little bit. Um, supernova within 30 light years. This one is 100 light years. And it happened apparently 2.8 million years ago if you're using the standard chronology, which means that that was a close call. Our sun is in the part of our galaxy best suited for life. Astronomers call that part the galactic habitable zone, or GHZ. Only about 10% of the stars in our galaxy are in the galactic habitable zone. We are about 27,000 light years from the galactic center. The GHZ probably extends a few thousand light years in either direction from our position. The metallicity, metal content, drops off rapidly. In our region, it goes down to about 5% for each 1,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. A safe path. Milky Way is a spiral galaxy with a central disk and curved or spiral arms of stars coming out from the center. In a spiral galaxy, stars orbit the center. Our sun takes about 225 million years to do this and has made about 20 circuits thus far. Skipping over, in addition to stars, spiral arms contain concentrations of interstellar gas. The gas accumulates in a sort of a density wave. It piles up like automobile traffic. Dense gas leads to star formation. Supernovae tend to occur in spiral arms because the relatively short lifetimes of massive stars present them from moving too far from their birthplaces before they explode. But we're in between them. Our sun's path around the galaxy is nearly circular. This helps avoid traffic. Our sun is also currently located near the plane of our galaxy in a relatively calm area far from the busy and dangerous regions of the Milky Way. It appears that we have been in this calm area for at least several tens of millions of years and perhaps for hundreds of millions of years. This stability, this extended period of calm, appears to be ne have been necessary for the survival of advanced life on Earth. To see why, we need to look at another serious danger for life. And then he has this picture, uh, which shows two galaxies apparently colliding. On June 30, 1908, a meteorite only 100 meters in diameter exploded in the atmosphere above Siberia. The blast was about 1,000 times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Japan an estimated 80 million trees over 803 square miles were destroyed. It remains the largest impact event re in recorded history. Probably the most amazing thing about that whole uh, episode is that nobody was killed. If it had gone off over New York or London or someplace like that, the uh, mayhem would have been horrible. Um, it remains the largest impact event in recorded history. About 65 million years ago, a larger meteorite hit the Earth near what is now the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. It was six to nine miles in diameter, big, but smaller than billions of objects in our solar system. It released over a billion times the energy of the atomic bombs dropped in World War II. And many think that it annihilated the dinosaurs. Over the last 500 million years, there have been other mass extinctions, some of which are believed to have been caused by collisions. Worst was the Permian-Triassic extinction event of two, 252 million years ago, also known as the Great Dying. It saw the extinction of 96% of all marine spe species and 70% of terrestrial vertebrate species. Now, the odd part of that is that you would think that the sea would protect the uh, marine species, and so most of the destruct destruction would be on the 
terrestrial species? Apparently not. Uh, raising some interesting questions. Even today, after five billion years of collisions and a gradual thinning of large objects as they crashed into Jupiter and other planets, the danger is great. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter has 211 objects more than 60 miles, or 100 kilometers, in diameter. Uh, it has at least 700,000 or more objects one kilometer or larger in diameter. In June 2013, NASA announced that it discovered the one to the 10,000th near-Earth objects, and there are at least 10 times that many more to be found. They define a near-Earth ob object as an object that can come within 28 million miles of Earth, and the known objects range up to 25 miles in diameter. Raises some interesting questions. Uh, um, some of you, I, I, I haven't actually seen it myself, but I understand that the movie Armageddon is about that precise scenario. And uh, uh, think about it, uh, a burning mountain cast into the sea figures in a first century work that some of you may have read. Uh, beyond Neptune lies the uh, Kupier belt, which is like the asteroid belt, but 20 times as wide and 20 to 200, to 200 times as massive. Pluto, with a diameter of uh, 2,300 kilometers, lies in the Kupier belt. And another dwarf planet three times further out, Eris, may be larger. A thousand times further out from Pluto, at the edge of the solar system, there is generally believed to be an Oort cloud of trillions of comets. The asteroid belt and the Kupier belt are mostly in the plane of the solar system, but the Oort cloud surrounds the solar system like a sphere. It is believed to contain many billions of objects 12 miles or larger in diameter. The average distance of Earth from the Sun, about 93 million miles, is called an astronomical unit, or AU. The Oort cloud is a spherical shell of lonely frozen comets 50,000 to 100,000 AU out, up to one-third the distance to the nearest star. The problem is that over millions and billions of years, very slight changes can shift objects into different orbits and create the dangers of collisions. When Earth was very young, billions of years ago, collisions were more frequent. During a period now called the Late Heavy Bombardment, about 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago, Earth was bombarded by objects, perhaps mostly from the Kupier Belt and the Oort Cloud. So it has been critical for life that our Sun is in a relatively stable part of the galaxy. Nearby stars could disrupt the solar system and result in a collision with, a large, uh, with an object large enough to vaporize all life on Earth. And as we will see, some people think that actually happened. Since no major civilization-threatening object has struck the Earth in all of recorded history, it is easy to think the danger is small, but it is always there. He mentions comet Hale-Bopp. He says if Hale-Bopp had hit the Earth, it might have released 100 times the energy of the collision 65 million years ago that killed off the dinosaurs and extinguished all plant and animal life. Um, now he's switched from this being a hypothesis to being uh, pretty much a fact. Although it seems to me that there were some mammals that survived somehow. The right sun. Some say that the sun is an ordinary star. That's not true. Our sun is special in several ways. First, it's about the right size. Our sun is relatively massive. About 95% of all stars have less mass. About 75% of all stars are so-called red dwarfs. Red dwarfs typically have larger variations in the energy they emit, which would pose problems for life. One minute you're too hot, another minute you're too cold. Um, because red dwarf stars are f much fainter, a planet with water in liquid form would have to be much closer, and the star's stronger gravitational attraction at that distance would likely cause the planet to become tidal locked, with one side always facing the star, like the planet Mercury around our sun, and our moon around the Earth. A tidal locked planet would have one side in extreme heat and the other in extreme cold, and it would be a poor candidate for life. Also, it would be difficult to hang on to an atmosphere in that, at that point because 
the atmosphere on the hot side would be blasted away and the atmosphere on the cold side would drift over to the hot side where it got blasted away. Our sun is big, but not too big. Stars with more mass than the sun burn out quicker. A star with 30 times the mass of the sun burns out in a few tens of millions of years. And a star with 1.5 solar masses in about 2 billion years. Our sun is about halfway through its 10 billion year period of relative stability. It is unlikely that more than about 10% of all stars have the right mass for life. By being in this favored 10%, our sun is special. Second, our sun is a solitary star, which permits planets to have stable orbits. Massive stars like the sun typically form in groups of two or three, and it appears that about two-thirds of the stars like our sun in our part of the galaxy at least, are part of binary or multiple star systems. Third, our sun is not part of a globular cluster, a dense collection of thousands of stars packed into a relatively small space. Fourth, the amount of light energy our sun gives out is relatively stable. Its output varies by only one part in a thousand over an 11-year sunspot cycle. Scientists aren't sure how long this stability has existed or how long it will continue. The right solar system. Stars and accompanying systems of planets form out of a huge collapsing cloud of gas and dust. That's at least the traditional story. As the cloud collapses, small amounts of angular momentum play a larger role, like a figure skater who spins faster when she pulls in her arms. And the cloud begins to spin faster and forms a disk. The center bulge of the disk becomes the star. The planets form further out. In the beginning, the planets are all revolving around the center star in the same direction, and their orbits are roughly circular. Uh, now, one of the things that he glosses over that's kind of interesting is that you would expect that most of the angular momentum of our solar system would reside in the sun. It has most of the mass, it's in the center, and everything contracts around it. In fact, most of the angular momentum in our solar system is found on the planet Jupiter, which spins once every 12 hours. Um, the sun spins once every 25 days in a relatively relaxed form. Uh, over millions and billions of years, this initial order can get messed up. One way in which our solar system is at least a little bit special is because all of the planets are still revolving around the sun in the same direction as the sun rotates. In some other systems, astronomers have detected planets with orbits in the opposite rotation to their parent star, probably because another star came close and pulled them off course, leading ultimately to wrong way orbits. This apparently did not happen to our solar system. It appears that no other stars have ever passed close. Special solar system. Our solar system is special because the orbits of all the planets are fairly circular and spaced out apart to reduce interference. Jupiter, and to a lesser extent the other outer planets, often protected the Earth from wayward objects. We saw that in 1994 when comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 crashed into Jupiter and was swallowed up. Jupiter has 318 times the mass of the sun and acts like the vacuum cleaner of the solar system. The outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, have developed stable orbits in harmony. Saturn, for example, takes exactly twice as long to orbit the sun as does Jupiter. Interesting little tidbit. Uh, according to computer simulations, this stability and harmony probably formed 700 million years after the birth of the solar system when Jupiter moved closer to the sun and Uranus and Neptune move, moved much further out and uh, apparently disturbed the uh, Kuiper belt. It appears that stable, well-ordered solar systems are rare, perhaps very rare. Based on computer simulations, conditions must be just right to create a solar system like ours the right place in the solar system. Just as there's a Goldilocks sun with the right amount of metals for stars in our galaxy, there's a Goldilocks zone, not too hot and not too cold for planets around their stars. Earth is near the inner edge of the solar habitable zone where liquid water can exist. 
Earth's orbit is special. It is only 1.7% uh, from being a perfect circle. In fact, when uh, Kepler was originally doing the calculations, he assumed that the uh, orbit was a perfect circle, and he found that it doesn't really matter whether you made it a circle or a very, very faint ellipse. Uh, Mars, on the other hand, he could prove was an ellipse, and then so when he came back, he said, well, the Earth must be too. From what we have learned to date, studying planets around other stars, this may be rare. Earth's near circular orbit keeps the amount of energy received from the sun relatively constant. The right moon. We now come to a feature of our planet that may be quite rare. It is the moon. Let's look at why the moon is unusual, and then why it is believed to have been absolutely critical to the development of life on Earth. To many scientists, the moon is something that shouldn't exist. There is still uncertainty as to how the moon was created. The most popular theory, sometimes called the Big Splat Theory, is that perhaps 4.4 billion years ago, Earth collided with a very large object about the size of Mars, and the collision resulted in a cloud of debris in orbit around Earth that ultimately collected to form the moon. But some evidence, such as levels of radioactivity in the moon rocks, does not agree with this theory. There is some evidence that pretty strongly does, or at least uh, argues that the Earth and the moon are somehow connected to each other. A new theory is that a natural reactor deep in the interior of Earth blew up the entire planet and that the pieces ultimately collected into our present Earth-Moon system. A bit difficult to visualize how you do that instead of just having heat uh, kind of boiling the Earth out, but whatever. This could explain the similarities in composition, but it is hard to see how the pieces came back together so nicely. Those people trying desperately to figure out how the moon was formed. It doesn't fit most of the theories that have been proposed. What is clear that compared to, is that compared to the size of its planet, our moon is the largest moon in the solar system. Well, except for Pluto, and Pluto is no longer a planet, so it doesn't count. Um, our moon is more than one quarter of the diameter of Earth. To some scientists, the moon, Earth moon system acts like a double planet. Well, except that the moon is definitely orbiting. The center of gravity of the Earth moon system is actually inside the Earth. The moon keeps the axis of Earth's rotation at about the same angle to its orbit around the sun. The moon prevents Jupiter from causing large changes in the tilt of Earth's axis. Also important to life are the tides. I won't go into detail on that one. It appears that such a large moon is rare, perhaps very rare. If a collision or explosion 4.4 billion years ago created the moon, there would be in a lot of dust. The Spritzer Space Telescope has found such dust in only one of about 400 young stars. This obviously would have happened early in the uh, solar system's age. Since very few collisions will result in a large moon, our moon may be rare indeed. In many ways, our moon is almost too good to be true. It appears in the sky to be almost exactly the same size as the sun. The sun is about 400 times farther away and is about 400 times larger in diameter. This coincidence occasionally gives rise to, rise to total eclipses where, when for a few minutes, the moon comes precisely between the Earth and the sun as viewed from the right spot on Earth. Total eclipses have, have helped scientists understand our universe. Experiments during total eclipses have measured the sun's corona to learn about stars, measuring the slowing of the rotation of the Earth, and confirmed Einstein's theory of general relativity by measuring how the light from the stars near the edge was bent by the sun's gravity. I want you to notice how useful it is for scientific discovery, almost as if somebody had planned it that way. The right ingredients. We are only at the beginning of understanding how planets form and what they are composed of, but Earth may have just about the right amount of various ingredients to sustain life. Let's start with water, and then there's carbon, and uh, it goes on. 
Water and carbon appear to be two ingredients of life. Despite, and he's quoting somebody, despite our best efforts to step aside from terrestrial chauvinism and to seek out other solvents and structural chemistries for life. For example, silicon, ammonia-based, etc. Uh, we are forced to conclude that water is the best of all possible solvents and carbon compounds are the, apparently the best of all possible ca carriers of complex information. Earth also has a large core of molten iron, which generates a strong magnetic field that deflects the solar wind and protects Earth's atmosphere from erosion. Finally, Earth has plate tectonics. Earth's crust is divided into huge plates that collide and grind into each other. Plate tectonics may be the central requirement for life. Because of plate tectonics, land exists and Earth is not a smooth globe uniformly covered with water. Because of plate tectonics, Earth's crust is constantly churning, which regulates the greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide. Because of plate tectonics, the temperature of Earth's surface has permitted liquid water for billions of years and life has evolved. Although you notice that he uh, doesn't think life has actually evolved, strictly speaking. There was God's help there too. But even if you assume evolution, the privileged planet is a challenge to your theory that God does, is not required. Earth is the only planet in the solar system with plate tectonics. When you add it all up, I think the evidence is strong that Earth is rare and special. Earth is in the right galaxy, is located at the right distance from the center of the galaxy, travels a safe path through the galaxy, has the right sun, is in the right solar system, is in the right place in the solar system, has the right moon, has the right chemical ingredients, and has plate tectonics. To me, these discoveries are the sixth wonder of modern science, the sixth of seven in our count to God. Next week, we'll look at what I consider, well, for us, of course, it'll be three, uh, pardon me, next wheel. Uh, it'll be three weeks from now when I talk about this. Uh, we'll look at what I consider to be the seventh wonder of modern science, the mathematical and non-material structure of the universe. Then we'll review the arguments for and against the existence of God. Last, I'll share you how, how I connect the dots after these 30 years. This is the concluding paragraph of uh, Doug L's chapter. And now my, my take on all this, Douglas L makes a good argument for the planet Earth being special. Some of these arguments are true regardless of any time issues. For example, Earth is in the solar habitable zone. And that's necessary even if you're thinking only in terms of thousands of years. Some of them are dependent on long ages. For example, Jupiter protecting us from comets. And I forgot to close the parenthesis. All of them are valid from a long age perspective. So in other words, if you're going to try to pretend that, that, the, that uh, evolution is true and that long ages for geologic uh, results are true, you're still stuck with these problems for uh, an Earth. And in fact, they get more acute the longer the period of time you're talking about. Uh, the one I am most impressed with is the moon and the sun being the same size as visualized from Earth. Now, I'm not sure that the moon has to be that size physically. In fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. If the moon were made out of denser rock, for example, it would be smaller. And every time we had an eclipse, it would be annular. And we would never get to see the sun's corona. Think about that. In order to get a good uh, view of the corona, you have to have the moon just exactly the right size as the, as the sun in terms of angular size. But it does make it more easy, much easy, much more easy for scientific discoveries. Now that means that the solar system was designed with the human mind in view. And if you want to know how important this is, remember, Guillermo Gonzalez never challenged evolution. Guillermo Gonzalez never challenged the age of the Earth. Guillermo Gonzalez uh, never even challenged the origin of life.
All he said was we live in a very special planet. It looks designed, and it looks designed not only for, um, for life itself, but for the discovery that humans make. That is, it was designed with science in mind. Of course, that's not something that you can, you know, select planets for. Think about that. We didn't need to know about the universe. And yet, because he's pointing out that there's a feature of the universe that looks like it was intelligently designed, that feature um, uh, was enough for his colleagues to say that he could not be promoted to professor with tenure. I, he could not get tenure. And that meant that he had to leave the department. Because that's the rule. If you, if you don't get tenure, you can't hang on hoping and hoping. No, once you've gotten so far, you're, you're stuck traditionally. So what I'm saying about that is that the conflict is not over evolution. The conflict is over is there evidence for God. You want to be very, very blunt about it. Um, methodological naturalism is making the world safe for atheists. If you cannot do that, if you start getting things that make atheists uncomfortable, you're a persona non grata in science. And if you're lucky, they won't discover that until after you've published. But you know, sometimes if they discover it fast enough, they will even yell and scream and get your paper retracted. That's happened to um, Steve Meyer. They couldn't just leave it in. They had to actually get it retracted so they don't have to deal with the arguments. Interestingly, that happened with some Chinese people who didn't really understand what they were doing but happened to mention the creator in their manuscript, and that was enough to get their paper retracted. It's, it's war. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. We've got a question back here. Um, is an eclipse necessary to see the corona? Can't you have filters that can see that? So would an eclipse just um, speed up when you figure that out, but wouldn't? Well, yeah, you might be able to think about, well, can I put something up that will take out? Uh, but the nice thing about a solar eclipses that makes it even, even better uh, is that you don't have a lot of scattered light coming into you from the side. See, in order to in order to do that, you need to you need to you need to do it in a darkened room that's open to the sun, and then and then put the uh, filter over it. Uh, and if you didn't even know it was there, you wouldn't know to put the filter over it. Um, I don't know that you'd say it's absolutely necessary to have total eclipses in order to figure this out. But it sure made it a lot easier. And the same thing is true of uh, starlight being bent by the sun. That they knew about it. It was theoretically possible to put filters in. But it was so much easier if they were doing it during a total eclipse. I don't even know whether you could have done it technologically. Uh, I mean, it's a very interesting question. Um, if you have the sun bearing down on you, can you even see those stars because of the scattered light from the sun otherwise? Um, I'm not, again, maybe there's some technological stuff that can be made to, to make it work. 
but I have, it would, it would be extreme and it may not exist. Well, I think Einstein crosses show. Well, Einstein figured it out by doing, um, uh, di by doing theoretical physicists and then he, physics, and then he told everybody to look for it, but everybody was waiting for the next eclipse to do it. Why? Because it's, like I say, it's technologically either extremely difficult or impossible. So when I say Einstein crosses, I'm referring to the, uh, the light coming through distant massive galaxies, cluster of galaxies, and you get these arcs, and you also get the cross. Uh, well, the, at first, what they were looking for is stars, individual stars, that had their light bent as they came around the sun. And it was very, very difficult to see that until there was a solar eclipse when you can actually see stars during the daylight. I understand that. What I'm saying is there's other ways of being able to see light being bent that mm -hmm. don't, don't require eclipses. Yeah, but would we have gotten to the technology to be able to say what those other stars were doing without having, uh, without having understood that relativity was the way things work to begin with? See, I mean, you're right. We may, we may eventually have got a tumble to it, but it was so much more convenient. <coughs> yes. Well, is he correct when he says all the planets in our, gal in our solar system rotate in the same direction? Because we got a couple of them that are retro. No, we don't have any retros. Oh. For planets, they all go the same direction. Venus or Mars? Venus and Mars all, all orbit what? in the same direction. No, no, I'm not talking about their their planetary spin. I'm talking what? about their That's about what I'm their orbital. No, uh, no, revolution. no. I'm talking about their rotation. Yeah, but we're talking we're talking about the uh, when he was talking They're about it talking before, about the whole he was circuit. talking about planets that actually go in the opposite direction. Yeah. I'm surprised he didn't raise that question about the rotation. Well, there's a couple of things. He may not have realized that after all his, you know, he is math and physics, and I guess physics includes astronomy, and so he probably knows quite a bit about astronomy. But the other thing is that uh, there are a lot of things that if you don't raise the question, you won't necessarily think of the answer. Um, and he may have thought of that and just decided, because, I mean, you can see how long the book is already. Uh, he may have decided to just leave that question on the cutting room floor. Uh, he is specifically emphasizing things that look like they require planning, uh, whereas why the planets should rotate, and some of them do rotate backwards. In fact, the, the interesting thing is that Venus goes backwards and goes backwards in such a way that it's, it presents the same face to Earth the whole time. Which is a little bizarre. Um, did, uh, uh, maybe I missed it, did, but did he take the probabilities and multiply them to, to get a number? Uh, I'm sorry? Did, uh, he, did he take the probabilities, all these factors about unique? Uh, uh, rare he didn't. Have you seen uh, Guillermo done? Gonzalez and Jay Richards have estimated that the odds of finding a planet like this are less than one in a hundred in our galaxy. Which means that the odds of finding another planet are less than one in a hundred in our galaxy. And that, uh, well, part of that is, you know, uh, that you can't get too close to the center and you can't get too far out as well. So that means all of them are in between the spiral arms. In the spiral arms is dangerous. In between the spiral arms, yeah, maybe you can make it. That happens to be where we are. Um, it's amazing to think 
about all the requirements there are and to think that Earth happens to fulfill all of them. I mean, it's almost as if it was planned. Yes. This man and others um, argue that plate tectonics is important and is necessary. Um, I think they're mistaken. It, it, it does certain things. You can argue that it does certain things for us, but um, you know, perhaps those could happen in other ways. Plate tectonics is the cause of tsunamis and earthquakes and volcanoes, and it kills an awful lot of people. That doesn't sound like the original good earth. And I suggest that the plate tectonics is a result of the flood, and that it must have had a design that accomplishes any benefits in other ways before that. Yeah. Or if John Baumgartner is right, plate tectonics was the cause of the flood. Well, yeah, I go along with that. That's just <laughs> Whichever. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you that I'm, uh, well, for one thing, there's a question of uh, whether plate tectonics has always been as slow as it is now. But it does cause massive problems. And uh, my son lived through that while he was in Japan. Um, yeah, it cut short his career as a, a, con a, uh, uh, a concert master there. He had to he had to leave when all foreigners had to leave Japan. And uh, you know, he was he was in the middle of the earthquake that followed it. Unfortunately, they were up on a hill where the the tsunami didn't get. But you know. I don't know if you have any of you have seen the videos. It was just horrendous destruction. It just, it, you know, totally messed up everything. Um, including, I think, the reactor that uh, that uh, caused the, everybody to have to leave. Uh, yeah. And he said he was in Tokyo and by the time he left, the only thing you could buy in the market was fish heads. You know, I guess when you run out of other food, you eat whatever you can. Pardon? Yes, that that is true. That is true. Anyway, comment. This is just a sideline comment, and I couldn't help it uh, but mention that when this tsunami was coming, especially in uh, Thailand, the water was receding, and the people, uh, uh, tourists, were all running into, uh, running after the water, going in, while all the animals were, were heading the other way. The other way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is true. They, uh, we don't always have as much sense as we think we do. Yeah. But where did that wisdom come from? Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. You cannot take this chapter uncritically and just plug it in. Um, especially if you're a short-age creationist. But I do think it functions as a limiting factor and you know if you're going to claim that uh, all of this world just you know kind of happened well it doesn't happen unless you have a very special planet on which to do that yeah. yes and then I'll I was just going to suggest he needs to go out and look at some of those layers and see how widespread they are and try and explain it on a long ages model I mean this is well, like I like it I blows said, your mind away yeah. when you look at them. Like I say, when you when you talk, uh, when I when I emailed him, why well, he emailed me that his his mind, uh, you know, he's this is where he was in 2014, and it is not an unreasonable place to be when you started from where he started from, but uh, you know that may change with time. Uh, it may be changing with time right now. And I, I think we want to be careful about, uh, it's okay to criticize a position. I think you want to be careful about criticizing him for taking it. Yeah. It, uh, you put that together of paraconformities, you've got a fairly uh, convincing case, at least, that uh, 
the real problems of long ages. Oh yeah, and if you combine that with genetic entropy, and you combine that with um, uh, you know soft tissue in dinosaurs, carbon fourteen in dinosaurs, carbon fourteen in coal, um, you know at some point you s you have to start saying you know there is a pretty fair amount of evidence that's pretty hard to account for if you're taking a long age perspective. Yes. It seemed to me, reading this chapter, I'm not a cosmologist, but it um, awful lot of um, assumptions in which you then build a mathematical theory around and see if you can get close without any available observable evidence because of the time span and the distances required for the things they claim or the methodologies for producing larger molecule or uh, atoms, et cetera. It seems pretty theoretical without much basis. So you could change your theory a little bit and off you go as long as you can get enough math to look like it might happen. Yeah, and, and as, he, as he notes, this is not quite the same argument as uh, the one that argues for the origin of life being designed. Uh, but it's interesting that it makes the opponents just as uncomfortable. They can't argue against it. You know, Brownlee and whoever is, uh, was uh, uh, Peter Ward, Ward and Brownlee, um, made their book, it made waves. Uh, there has not been a book that I've seen that comes out and says, Brown and Wardley are off because they assume this and it really isn't true and they assume that and it really isn't true. That the fact of the matter is that if you are stuck with random uh, planets coming with random suns, uh, it doesn't work very well. You know, there's some, a whole series of seven beautiful planets. Well, we can't see them, so we don't know whether they're beautiful or not. Um, I suspect is that, uh, I suspect that that they don't look very beautiful for the simple reason that one side is baked and the other side is is uh, frosted. Um, but there's there are seven planets lined up around a dwarf star, but they're too close, and the dwarf star can kill life that's developing cl where it can r reach a radiation simply by you know sending out solar flares that just cook everything, and those planets are always with their face to the sun as far as we can tell. Um, they're in close enough that they should be tidally locked. Most people don't realize how uncharacteristic it is. Earth is the first planet out that has a decent rotation. You know, our 24 hours, or more precisely 23 hours and 56 minutes, um, is actually... Um, uh, I mean, Venus is almost stopped. Mercury is almost stopped. Um, and then, of course, there's Mars, which is a little further out that does have a 24, uh, incredibly close to 24-hour uh, uh, rotation with an incredibly close to 23-degree uh, angle of inclination. And then you have Jupiter, and you have Saturn, and uh, you have Uranus, which is actually spinning sideways. Slightly reversed, in fact, to the typical. Um, and Neptune, which has a more standard rotation. Um, all of the moons that I have been able to check on are tidally locked with their planet. That is to say, they always show the same face to the planet. Our moon's not that unusual in that regard. Uh, tidal locking is something that happens. You know, you almost wonder whether the Earth, once upon a time, had its face to the one face to the sun, and then God decided to make it spin. An interesting question, but whatever. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I agree with these arguments for fine tuning. There, there's one other one that I 
I, I have doubts about at least. And that is the idea that to get our heavier elements, they have to be produced in stars. I mean, maybe God used that mechanism to spread the elements around, I don't know. But also, he certainly could have created them where he needed them. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that that's, that's one that a creationist is hesitant to use as a, an actual argument. I do think, though, that it is fair to use it when people are insisting, well, it's all natural. Then, the, then I think you can say, well, if it's all natural, then where did our elements come from? And they say, well, it's from the stars. Uh, well, how did we get so many of them on an earth? And, and I think that's a legitimate question to ask when people, when people insist. Um, of course, it's frustrating for them because they say, well, how did your system do it? Well, God did it. <laughs> So I can understand the frustration of a, a scientist who feels like we, you know, our God always rides to the rescue. Uh, on the other hand, our God has to ride to the rescue, for example, in the origin of life. So why are we insisting that he can't do it in other regards? What I think is amazing is that the sun and the moon look like they're designed. I mean, if the moon was a little denser rock, if the moon was a little lighter rock, it would cover the sun quite a bit and you wouldn't see the phenomenon of the corona all the way around. You'd see a little piece of it just before the sun came out, which might not be as easily understood or as easily visible. So I think the thing that's amazing is that the Earth is where it is almost set up for scientific discovery. If we were in a more densely populated area of the galaxy, we wouldn't be able to see more than our immediate star neighborhood. And that's an interesting fact, too. Yes. Uh, Obviously, I'm asking this question from total ignorance. And, uh, but I hear so much about cosmic dust which constitutes apparently um, in total unbelievable mass of substance, not only in this galaxy, but all of the others, spiral galaxies and mostly, mostly uh, are composed of cosmic dust and gas what is that cosmic dust? I've heard uh, mostly evolutionary sources, and I presumed facetiously, claim that is, there are actual microtubules and polyaromatic uh, substances of various sorts, which uh, somehow or another stole rides on meteors and came down to this earth, and that was the origin of life. Do we know that much about cosmic dust, particularly uh, throughout the universe rather than just simply in this particular spiral galaxy? Um, no. Um, there's, there are questions as if there's that much dust, why doesn't it scatter light more? Um, because there are actual places where there is more cosmic dust and it does scatter light, and you can see it. Well, it certainly is opaque. Uh, you look at the Hubble photographs mm -hmm. and the cosmic gas, cosmic dust can certainly be opaque and contribute to the incredible patterns yeah. that are seen. It must be quite a heterogeneous kind yeah. of substance, but it is interesting that the ma imaginations have uh, taken the directions that it's well, primitive microtubules, and that's where our mitochondria came from. Well, I, I think one of the things you have to keep in mind in that situation is that there are a lot of speculations without a lot of evidence, but if they... Um, encourage the idea that, that 
life on Earth is feasible and, and uh, evolution is feasible without um, divine intervention, they're looked favorably upon. Uh, questions where that, that scenario gets called into question um, are, well, they're looked upon sometimes as interesting puzzles, but they're certainly not advanced. Uh, by most of the people who are doing these things because most of the time they want the story to end and so we don't really need God to create us. That's the purpose of the theory. The theory is not um, purposeless. There is actually a, a purpose for the theory. How much is known about cosmic dust? Uh, not very much. Isn't the cosmic dust um, supposed to be one of the arguments against long life for the moon because the gravitational pull of the moon was supposed to have collected a certain depth of cosmic dust? Or is that an old argument that doesn't make sense? You know, I'm old enough to remember before they actually landed on the moon and to have read some of those arguments about how we had to be careful of how much dust there was. And they were strong enough that when they designed the lunar lander, it had massive shields and it had three foot long spikes to go into the dust to stabilize it. Um, now, there are people who will claim, and perhaps with some justification, that by the time we got to the moon lander itself, we had realized it wasn't that thick. Uh, but it does raise an interesting question. If that is the case, then why did they not saw off those uh, spikes? Because uh, when, uh, I mean, the second one that went up there, the spikes were much, much shorter. And um, the, uh, you would think that if they knew, if they strongly suspected, the spikes could have been removed. As it was, Neil Armstrong had to jump from the lander onto the moon's surface. Uh, and that's a matter of historical fact, and you know, you can't change that, although a lot of people want to. Uh, a lot of people want to say, oh, we, we didn't really think that. Well, if they didn't really think that, then why they designed the lander the way they did? Uh, and you can find people who said that ahead of time. We don't know what we're going to find. Maybe there's three uh, feet, or maybe there's 20 feet of lunar dust, and they'll just kind of sink in, and, then, and uh, you know, they'll die there on the moon. They won't even be able to come back to Earth. Um, and there were, there were people who were saying that, because I remember, because I was there. Uh, comment way back, um, and then uh, we'll circle around to. So just a couple of Google results uh, while you're talking. So uh, Saturn's moon Phoebe is not tidally locked, and I think there's a few other moons that are not tidally locked. Saturn's moon Phoebe is not tidally locked. Okay. And some others are not tidally locked. And then those spikes served as lunar surface sensing probes. So if you have contact light, that means the probes are touching the surface, but it's not fully down the surface. And so then you cut the engines because you know you're at that distance above the surface. Um, I read an article in Time. I don't know if anyone's heard about this, but NASA is building a huge telescope, telescopic mirror. They're going uh -huh. to put it on some platform. I don't know. It just looks really complicated. And they're going to send it out a million miles away, out into space. And they're hoping to find the source of the Big Bang. And they'll have all the answers. <laughs> this is, it's just a really remarkable article. Uh, interesting theory. Supposing that the answer comes out that... Uh, uh, God created the Big Bang. I wonder if uh, I wonder if that would get broadcast. 
It'll but, be interesting uh, to see what they do find. It's not it's not yeah. set to go to be launched until next a year. Uh, I think October of 2018. Yeah. Now, are they going to have detectors on on that uh, stuck with that mirror? In other words, are they, are they going to make it into an actual telescope? It um, no, it. Um, <coughs> or is it It's an in. It it's like it's infrared or something. Oh, okay. It works through yeah, infrared, not through the regular okay. way. Then they have to have that uh, with detectors in space because in uh, our atmosphere absorbs infrared strongly, and so if you try to reflect infrared to without having a without having the detector out in space, you, it's not. Uh, technically feasible to have one on Earth. Anyway, uh, I guess we have one more comment? Or? Yeah. And then uh, after this we'll probably call it quits. Um, human activity caused the Mount uh, Pinatubo eruption, as you know, that caused the big uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, the <laughs> The cosmic dust all over and it changed the weather pattern. It's uh, all because of us human beings. <laughs> Interesting. Well, next week we're going to talk about quantum mechanics and its influence uh, on uh, uh, theology, if you like. Not, not next week, not three next weeks. week, three weeks from now. Uh, we will We will get back to you as to whether and who will manage the uh, uh, if we have a Sabbath school um, until further notice you're free to assume that we don't have uh, that we won't have one but uh, if if we can find a speaker for you why we will do that so see you at least in three weeks